Welcome everyone to today's performance clinic, Power Dashboarding in Dynatrace. I'm Andy Grabner and I'm very lucky to have two power dashboarding gurus with me who delivered the hands-on training they perform on that topic. And that's why I also invited them over to do a performance clinic. John Kelly, AKA Tech Shady, Lucas Hawker, AKA, I don't know. Do you have any other name? No. No, just that's Lucas. Good. That's good. Um, uh, by the way, because I always get this question, yes, this webinar, this performance clinic is recorded. You will see it on YouTube as well as on university.dynatrace.com if you go to the Dynatrace webinars. The link to the YouTube is the first bit.ly link, that short link that you see right now. And if you are live and you have questions, please put them into the Q&A feature. If you have questions later on, you'll find us online and let us know uh, what, how we can help you. But now I want to hand it over to John and Lucas because I'm very excited to see what you guys have been teaching people around power dashboarding in Dynatrace and now having a large audience online. They also are interested in how they can benefit from the stuff that you've been promoting. Take it away. Awesome, Lucas. There you go. Take it away, Lucas. All right. Get some okay. remote control challenges. Put a delay there. Yeah. There we go. All right. So for today, what we want to go through is you know, a number of different topics. Uh, I'll start off on, you know, what should I dashboard? I think a lot of times we talk with kind of new customers and, you know, they're used to using other kinds of monitoring tools. So we see kind of very classic dashboards. So we'll go through quickly. Um, you know, differences between how to dashboard with Dynatrace than, than maybe some other tools. Then John will take us through, you know, what makes a good dashboard. We'll get into some exciting stuff with some experimental dashboard features, which we call power-ups. Um, and I'll connect that back into, you know, how that relates to our product roadmap. And then finally, John will take us through uh, the BizOps configurator, uh, which is kind of a tool that we've been using for deploying you know, lots of bespoke dashboards uh, that are you know, completely customized. So we think about what should I dashboard? Um, you know, you wanna start by thinking about who's your audience? You know, are you creating a dashboard for incident response teams? Um, you know, people that need to know when there's an issue. Are you creating it for executives, uh, line of business owners, things like that? Or are you creating it for analysts and developers who really want to dig deep? And think about what kind of information do you want to get across? Are we trying to communicate that something's broken? Are we looking for changes in business KPIs? Or are there just some sort of interesting metrics that you want to focus on? And then finally, think about the interaction mode. You know, is this a dashboard that's going to be up on a TV? Uh, is it going to be something where you, you have it up during a, a critical a business period and you need to make quick decisions uh, based on the data? Or is it something where you want it more interactive and you wanna be able to like dig into the data? So obviously you can do all three of those use cases with Dynatrace dashboards. So let's take a look at a few examples. So we think about incident response kind of use cases, kind of that kiosk or TV mode. Uh, you want things that are you know big and easy to read uh, things that uh, it, it's very easy to tell, you know, things are good, things are bad. You know, in the example we show over on the right, we know that there's an issue with the mobile apps straight away. So in these, using these kind of honeycomb uh, tiles is a great way to communicate health. Uh, it's packing a whole bunch of different metrics into that single tile and giving you a quick green or red, things are good or bad. You might want to have maybe just one or two kind of business metrics here that kind of unify the, the view of, you know, what's going on from a business perspective. But generally avoid, you know, lots of line charts and busy things that you can't easily tell what's going on from far away. The next type of uh, dashboards that we see a lot of are um, what, what we would call like decision cockpits. So being able to kind of quickly look at the data and understand you know, 
is test case A doing better? Or is test case B doing better? You know, is our marketing campaign working? Are we, you know, not getting conversions from it? You know, something where you can quickly evaluate, you know, those kind of trade-offs and things like that. So a lot of times you'll see dashboards with kind of like a left side and a right side or a top and a bottom, things like that that make it very easy to make decisions. And then kind of the, the final kind of way we look at these are, you know, ones that are more of a workflow. So things that are interactive, having, you know, several kind of linked together dashboards. It's like this one here, we're looking at user journeys and, you know, we see that there's a high amount of abandons. So we drill in and we can see, you know, directly, you know, it's duration that's causing those abandons. You know, it's, it's not certain geographies, it's not certain aptics or errors or things like that. Um, so you should be able to, you know, drill in, understand lots of different dimensions and things like that. So the, the other kind of side of, of dashboarding when you come to Dynatrace is really thinking about how to do things in an automated way versus kind of traditional manual ways. So over on the left, we have you know, a typical dashboard, brand new people to Dynatrace create pretty much the same dashboard over and over in lots of different ways. And when you look at it, you know, we can see, oh, memory's increasing. Oh, there was a throughput spike. Maybe IOPS jumped. Oh, there's page faults. But you don't really understand, you know, does that mean anything? Kind of the Dynatrace way of looking at little metrics like those is really using things like the honeycombs because the AI Davis is looking at all of those metrics to understand you know, the environment health. So we can quickly tell you know, all of that is just noise, everything's fine. So if you think about scaling that out from you know, a single host to you know, a bunch of hosts, okay, now you've got you know, kind of this um, line graph soup here. You know, looking at this, I can't tell you, you know, any idea what's going on there. But if I look over on you know, the honeycomb tile, I can see 70 hosts are all doing fine. So if you think about scaling that out, you know, what if it was 1,000 hosts? What if it was 10,000 hosts? You know, that, that honeycomb kind of tile is uh, quick and easy to scale that, that way. So let's look at one more example of scale. You know, here we're also looking at you know, service health. So, you know, are my software components doing well, as well as my host health? You know, here we can quickly see, you know, across eight different data centers, uh, you know, are things good or bad? And we can see there's one host down here in our DFW data center, it's having an issue. So you can quickly click on that and drill down. So when you create dashboards in Dynatrace, you know, think about scale, think about automation, think about who's your audience and how do you want to interact with the dashboards? So John, uh, over to you for you know what makes a good dashboard. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Um, so if you've seen any of the presentations I've done before, um, I usually have these uh, main highlighted points here about what really goes into making a good dashboard. And, and so I've kind of organized these into more of a, uh, like as you go after creating a dashboard from the get-go, uh, the very first thing you want to really look at is designability. Right, and that's where you get the clear defined goals from whoever's going to be the user of the dashboard, understand the intent. And typically what we see is and it's not limited to just these three, three categories, uh, but we see it's broken down into operational executive analytic type of dashboards. And when you start to now build out to actually start to build these type of different dashboards, uh, the key thing here is to treat dashboards and everything that goes along with it as code. Right? So when you build your metrics, attributes, your properties to support designability, you know, that is really kind of the approach that you know, these dashboards are underlying code and all the metrics that are associated with it. A big point, and I'll I have more about this in a few minutes, and I'll show an example. Um, after Lucas comes back on, I'll, I'll show a little bit more about this, is really data integrity. Um, and it's not just to make sure you have valid data that's not, you know, averaged or, you know, have different kind of, uh, you know, faults or errors or gaps, but it's all about really the correct context of that data, which is very important. 
And I'll kind of show that here in a few minutes as you go through. Uh, the couple of last several different points here um, is really important is that you want to really have a nice uh, symmetry type dashboard where you have clear grouping of your content and the space. And always remember that when anyone reads a dashboard or views it for the first time, they read left to right, top down. So your most important content should always be in the upper left and the least important for that particular dashboard should be down towards the bottom right. You know, glanceability is another key one is that we don't wanna overload the content, right? And, and I always kind of say avoid pie charts, but I do use them and I'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, avoid what I call multi-dimensional pie charts and I'll explain that in a few minutes, but also the pie chart itself, a lot of times it's not very glanceable. Um, if you have three to five splits, it's ideal but sometimes you have a dashboard, which is a pie chart tile, and you have 15, 20 different uh, splits on that. It gets very difficult to quickly look at that and understand where you need to focus as you go through. And overall, you know, the last couple of points here is just you really keep it simple. You want to tell a clean, consistent story within the dashboard, uh, limit the color, uh, size all the fonts appropriately. So again, you, from a visual point of view, one of the main things you never wanna draw attention away, right? And I create a lot of different dashboards. Sometimes I do it just for fun or I have different graphics and so forth, but you don't want the focus on the graphic, you want the focus on the data. Uh, and then lastly, make really good use of different links and images as you go through, okay? Now just to look at a couple examples here. This is a dashboard that's for the city of London and it just has a lot of content, right? There's not really good symmetry, just there's just way too much going through. I kind of refer to this dashboard as a yard sale dashboard. Uh, so in the United States, you know, during the spring, summer, we have these yard sales where you go into a subdivision and people just are selling like all their crap or junk and so forth. You have like books, you know, children's clothes, old golf clubs. It's just a hodgepodge of everything, right? And so we at Don and Trace don't want to make dashboards like this. It just seems like you're just putting too much up and there's no constant theme. Uh, the color schemes off and a lot of different things that go forward with it. So be very clear, consistent. If you wanna tell a show a dashboard that's focused on weather, then just use those, right? Uh, those particular tiles that support that as you go forward. Another thing here is I mentioned about pie charts, right? So here's a really good tile uh, built on AppDex because I can look at this very quickly. I have three real splits on here, which is uh, AppDex by satisfied, tolerated, and frustrated. And so I can look at this pie chart and quickly tell that the vast majority of my users are satisfied and I can move on quickly. So Andy, I'm gonna put you to the test here. So this is a pie chart that has a few more items on it, right? But still it's kind of really readable. So, so Andy, I've promoted you to the chief marketing officer here at Dynatrace, all right? And your goal is that you have a budget of where you need to figure out if you're gonna spend how much budget on your, your marketing medium campaign. And the medium is just kind of the method of communication users come into your site. So it's either like through like, you know, typically like these paid searches. So you go to Google's a paid search, you click on a link, you go to dontrace.com. So Andy, question is that you're now the chief marketing officer at Dontrace. So congrats on your promotion. Uh, I do now see that almost 95% of all my conversions are coming from the uh, paid search is, do you want to continue the investment? Is that a good investment? If they convert, then it would be great. Yeah, I think so. All right. Right, I would be so interested Andy to see. Andy says huh? that 99% of our budget is on the uh, paid search and he wants to continue that, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where, you know, the uh, data integrity becomes an issue, right? because this is actually showing you just the total number of conversions broken down by marketing medium. It doesn't tell me how many requests are coming in uh, on paid searches, emails, and so forth. So if I break that down a little bit more and I look at the paid searches, CPC up top, if over the past, whatever time frame I have, if I have over 2,600 sessions came in there, but only 148 converted, All right? So this tells a much different story where mm -hmm. my converted rate for paid searches is about 5.59%, right? Mm -hmm. You look at things like uh, email or event and even website, they convert at a much higher rate. 
So what we'd want to do is maybe shift our budgeting to more of the email and event and drive up the number of sessions. So, you know, spend more money to promote more email type campaigns. And we're gonna to start to see a better return because we're converting at a 33% uh, rate with email and with event. So Andy, unfortunately, we'll have to, you know, put you back so, to your- So I'm, I'm not, not going to be promoted to the chief of marketing anymore, damn it. It was, it was a good short stay there, but yeah. again, uh, yeah. data integrity is huge, right? And you might not think, you know, hey, I'm looking at all the data, mm -hmm. but it's just the, the, uh, the context. Right, so if you're looking at just pure conversions, you're thinking, yeah, it's great, let's keep spending all the money on the paid searches, but we're only getting a 5%, 5.59% return on that. We wanna drive it higher so that the theory is do more email, get more sessions coming from there because we'll convert at a much higher rate as we go through, okay? So that's just kind of a little bit, I'm gonna get into now, uh, switching back over to Lucas, who's going to talk more about the experimental features, and I'll come in towards the end to start looking at actually deploying and starting to work with some of these different dashboards. So Lucas, take it away, sir. Yep. So th there was actually a, a question in the Q&A really around, you know, using colors and things like that, and you know, that's exactly what we're going to get into now. So, um, you know, John and I have been doing a lot of dashboards across uh, Dynatrace, and, you know, we also spend a lot of time talking with R&D about hey, we need this feature, hey, we need that feature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so one thing that we came up with was a Chrome extension where we can test out some visualizations, et cetera, and kind of show R&D you know, exactly this is what we're looking for and also do some experimentation with it and see, you know, do customers find this useful as well? So uh, this Chrome extension allows us to, you know, experiment with different visualizations. So you'll notice a lot of the dashboards we're showing here today have a lot of color and new features that maybe you haven't seen before. So uh, let's let's drill in here, and then maybe uh, Andy, if you can maybe copy these links for the first two into the chat, that'd be helpful. Let's click on the first one here. This is um, taking you to the GitHub page for uh, Chrome extensions. So I scroll down, um, there's a brief description of what you know, the project is, as well as um, you know, contents on how to install it, how to configure it, and then each of the different uh, visualizations that we've included there. The second link uh, will take you directly to the Chrome store. And this is where you would install the extension. So it's not publicly listed, but uh, if you have the link, you can install the extension. So you would just see add to Chrome here. You see we already have it, so it says remove from Chrome. And that's, that's really all that's required to install it. So let's take a look at a couple examples. And before I leave this slide, just, just one more comment. Uh, it is community developed and supported, so please don't open support tickets for it. Um, you know, it's it's really John and I kind of uh, covering this. Uh, so you from the GitHub page, you, you can create an issue there and um, you know comment on it, etc. And that's all public, so we can you know tell you know where um, power ups are working for you, where there's issues, new features you might want to try, etc. So let's look at a couple examples. That's interesting. Uh, John, can you flip me over to um, the Chrome? There we go. So here's a, a dashboard just kind of displaying a bunch of different, uh, these visualization power-ups that uh, we're talking about. Uh, so you can see here some color changing icons that you can use to kind of show quickly, you know, what part of my, my business is doing well, which part's having issues. So I can quickly see you know, revenues in yellow, fulfillments in red, um, allowing you to do things like tool tips in your uh, charts, color changing uh, numbers in your single value tiles, color thresholds and charts. So those are uh, some of the things that we, we've had a lot of good feedback on. Um, People have been using those quite a bit. 
Heat maps have been another feature that uh, a lot of people have found interesting. You'll kind of notice there for a second that it, it initially pops up with the original visualization and then the new visualization uh, gets pasted on top of it. So this one is you know, showing a heat map, being able to show app decks so you can quickly see you know, over a week or over a month, you know, how, how is our uh, app decks doing across our different applications? This is a good way of kind of showing multiple dimensions there. Another uh, feature we've seen a lot of usage on is uh, the math power up. So in this example, we're, we're getting the data from these other tiles here. So we see Google, Bing, Instagram, and Facebook, and then we're calculating the average there. Again, all of these um, are, are really happening based on the Chrome extension, changing the visualization after things, after things happen. And if I go back one, let's uh, drill into one of these just to kind of show you what the, uh, the markup is looking like. So most of the, the power-ups will have this kind of uh, markup that you'll see in either the title of the uh, tile or you'll see it in a markdown tile with kind of more, um, more of the syntax there. So in this one, you know, we're doing that, that color change and we're saying, you know, base is high. So it's, it's good if this number is high. Our warning threshold is uh, 20 and our critical threshold is five. So you can use those to, you know, automatically change the color of that um, automatically. Uh, just John, one, 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 one quick feedback here and also some questions. Um, sure. I think you mentioned, right, this is a great extension uh, that you use to test out new features, like what you just showed with the, the color grading, like the area between warning and pass. This is also now in already as part of the core product coming in the new uh, Metrics Explorer or the, um, yeah, I think the Metrics Explorer is what it's called. So this is why this is great that we have these capabilities, testing it out, and then bringing it also to the core to the core product as just a standard feature, not needing the, the extension. And then just, I know Lucas, you said it, but I think Scott and Nick are asking, do people need uh, to have this browser extension installed to leverage these capabilities, yes or no? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, most of the dashboards, we recommend that you put um, a disclaimer at the top saying that the dashboard requires the extension. And um, in the GitHub uh, webpage, there's uh, an example of that. So that um, you know, when users come to the dashboard, they quickly can tell you know, this requires an extension, gives them a link for it. Uh, if they already have the extension, that disclaimer automatically gets hidden. Um, so it, it makes it pretty quick and easy uh, to communicate to users whether they have the extension or not. Um, let me show you just one more uh, recent visualization that we came up with. Uh, so this one is looking at uh, a little bit of uh, statistics and projections. So here we're creating just a uh, linear regression based on this chart and then projecting it out a bit further. Uh, so that's pretty cool, I think. Um, might be, be useful for users trying to figure out, you know, where is this gonna go next? Um, down below, we're looking at, uh, I think an exponential moving average. So you can kind of understand, you know, what's kind of the band that we expect our data to live within. Um, so there's, you know, more of these things that we're kind of trying out, um, you know, looking for feedback, you know, is this useful for you? Is it not useful? Does it look cool, but, you know, it doesn't provide a ton of value. Uh, so what we're uh, doing with this is the extension also um, includes what we call OpenKit. Uh, John, can you help me out here and get me back into the slides here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we use OpenKit and the metric ingest um, to understand, you know, what's happening inside the extension. So, you know, when there's errors or crashes in the extension, uh, John and I get notified about that. 
Uh, we also get some data on you know which power-ups are being used. So we're we're break we're segmenting that by you know customer usage, internal usage, uh, and we're using that data to to really uh, up level that conversation with R and D around you know these are the visualizations that you know we need to include in the roadmap. You know here's you know good data showing that users are going to use this visualization, etc. Um, I also have a blog post here that goes through in more detail exactly how we did that. Uh, with OpenKit and Metric Ingest, uh, but you know, having good data allows R and D to make better decisions around, you know, which visualizations do we invest in, which ones do we not. Hey Lucas, uh, yep. there was a couple of questions. Uh, one was around the permissions of this plugin because it asks you for not just the Dynatrace com but also other domains, and the person that posted it suggested it might be because you know you have managed tenants as well so that this works for these as well anything that is configurable then um, configure so, the domains yep so that that's good feedback um, the permission set that that Google allows for extensions is uh, somewhat difficult to use um, but right now uh, what we have in there and I think you should be able to see this uh, from the extension is that uh, it's anything for Dynatrace.com, as well as some of the non-production Dynatrace URLs. And then anything that um, has a, a URL that has the slash E slash, uh, which is used by managed. Mm -hmm. um, so that way, you know, we're limiting it to just kind of Dynatrace dashboards. Mm -hmm. um, so the extension doesn't do anything on any other pages. Uh, but that is something we want to continue tightening that up on uh, to try to reduce the um, the review cycles by Google. Because each time we publish an update, uh, you know, it takes a week or two for Google to say, "Yep, this is this is good. This can be pushed out to the user base." Thanks. Any other questions? <clears throat> I think, you know, you just mentioned, it was mentioned a couple of times that, and it, you have it on the page here as well. This is feedback that we collect. Some features have already made it into the core product, like the, the tooltips, the color thresholds, uh, more are coming. And, uh, but this is a great way for everyone to give us, give you and us feedback on what to invest in next. I think that's the key thing. Yeah. Yep. And really we could do a whole nother webinar just on Explorer and the new features that, that mm -hmm. keep popping up there. Yeah, it's really exciting what the, the product team's doing there. Yeah. Um, John, I think that covers power ups. So, um, all right, let me take away from here. And actually, before I move off the screen, so if you notice the power up usage um, over here in the where it says customer usage tile, if you look, there's three out of the four top most used uh, power up features are color, math, and heat maps. And so if you've seen a roadmap, and these are all on the very short-term roadmap within mm -hmm. Dynatrace. So with the new Explorer, uh, being able to do calculations, uh, calculated metrics in there, uh, heat maps, colorization, that's all built in there, right? So this is a, a great opportunity for the, the Dynatrace community, right? Mm -hmm. To, if they're using this, or even just give feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's that is as Andy and both Lucas mentioned, you know, we're we're watching this. This information is fed back. So if we start to see things like, you know, doing comparisons or you know, different things we do with uh, tables, if that starts to pop up, become more popular, get a lot more feedback, you'll start to see these things work their way through the product as a whole. All right. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna get into is the uh, the BizOps configurator. All right, and so if, if you've uh, seen from previous, uh, not just the past perform, but the perform before, it was heavily script driven uh, in terms of being able to deploy dashboards out in an automated fashion into your tenant. Uh, so coming out of last year's perform, Lucas came you know, up with a good idea. So let's move this into a, a single page app and you can access this. Uh, Andy, if you wanna pop this also into the, uh, into the chat window. Uh, and then these links will also be provided uh, afterwards as, as well. But this is a you know, great way for you to go in. We have a stock number set of curated dashboards and you can pick and choose whichever dashboard you, you want. And then via the API, we're going to interrogate and prompt and get information about your particular tenant and then build those dashboards for you very quickly. All right. And so I'll go through a, a hands-on live walkthrough on how we can use this. 
And ultimately what I'm gonna to get to and show you a little bit more is what is this user journey dashboard. This is a really rich feature dashboard. It, it does use Power Apps. I also have versions of this dashboard that do not use Power Apps. All right, and anytime I create the content, uh, I always attempt and try to create both a Power Up version, which gives more features like, you know, these icons turning colors where I can see that I have a problem with my search and login in my particular user journey, and the ability to drill to other link dashboards. Uh, also create a non-power version as well too, to be able to support that. So let's take a look here and let's get out to, uh, I'm gonna open up a new tab here, go into my BizOps configurator. And so when you hit into the BizOps configurator here, uh, first thing you wanna do, and the, the, the prereqs will tell you about how to, what you need in terms of a token created, but you can put in both either your SAS or managed uh, tenant URL here and then your token and simply go ahead and connect. And now you're into the actual Dynatrace uh, BizOps configurator, you're connected to your tenant, and now you have the ability to uh, deploy different dashboards. Up here, we have something in the first line here, which is our current flow. That's where all of our new content, everything's being pushed through. The legacy flow is only being supported, I believe, for some SAP dashboards. Uh, so it's kind of what we call our legacy. They'll be deprecated here soon, as soon as we port and move up all the SAP dashboards into the more current flow. Uh, but for anyone that wants to go ahead and, and run the BizOps configurator, uh, use the current flow and just simply click on deploy. All right. Now what you'll see is you get into the, the use case menu and it's broken down into different personas and use cases. And every time I go and drill in here, for example, I want to go down here and pick, like for example, a, 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 let's say an IT executive. Then under here, we have different use cases that are geared towards you know, IT executives like application overview. And what you'll see is a number of workflows that we've targeted to the IT exec from the application overview perspective. And these are all the different dashboards that you can go ahead and deploy, right? Now, any dashboard that has this gem icon is just kind of showing you here that that is a dashboard that's gonna use power ups. So the one I've chose here, you know, doesn't have anything from a power up perspective. So you can just simply deploy this dashboard. If you scroll down, some of the dashboards will show prerequisites where it will tell you that, hey, you need to create some key user actions or some properties, some metrics and so forth. And we'll specify each of those that show up down here as well. Uh, so again, you can go through each of the different personas, you know, kind of pick a persona like uh, ops that works out and then you can go ahead and see all the different type of dashboards that are available. Up in the upper right hand corner for this dashboard is the ellipsis box. If you click it, you can flip over and actually go by maybe different owner repos. So we have a number of contributors here within Dynatrace. If you wanna be a contributor, reach out. We'd love to have you as you know, per, if you have some really great dashboards. Uh, we can actually put them into one of our existing repositories, or if you have a repository, we can actually start to pull from that as well. We can work with you to create that content. Uh, if you're you know, running Citrix, uh, Jason's one of our uh, contributors here. He's, he built out some really great dashboards here as well. So you can go down and pick even like a guy named Tech Shady, which is me. And then there's all the dashboards you know, that I've actually contributed here as well. One other view here is to just simply go off. You don't want to go down to different owners, personas, and so forth. What you'll see here is about 66 or so. We add usually a couple per week of different dashboard packs that are available for you to go ahead and install at any point in time. So very easy to be able to find the right dashboard and then just go ahead and deploy it. Now this dashboard here, which is showing you an AB compare, I have both a power up version and a non power up version, right? So either way you can deploy a dashboard that's gonna show you know, left side versus right side. And the prerequisite here in order to get this dashboard to work is just telling you that you have to create a session property that captures what is the A application, the B application, right? And, and basically have like a selector that shows what is release A and release B. And then we'll do side-by-side -side comparisons within this particular dashboard. And then we also have a non power version of this dashboard here as well. So what I'm gonna do here is walk through and I'm gonna go actually go ahead and install uh, one of the different dashboards. So I'm gonna to go to ops and the use case I'm gonna look here is platform overview. And I'm gonna install something here, CPU utilization, right? And again, as you notice, 
I also have a non-par version. I'm going to go ahead and just deploy the par version here real quickly. And you'll see also a little prompt here that says, hey, that this dashboard pack requires you know, PARP and so forth. This is a very simple dashboard. These are all pretty much out of the box. So if I go ahead here and click next, I can give this a friendly name. And so we'll call this, for example, Andy, or whatever name you want to put in front. And the only thing I'm doing here within the power-ups for this is, is providing a, another background. So it's going to show you that you can use in these different power-up features and deploy a dashboard here quickly. Um, and then you can see that, hey, how are they doing the power the backgrounds? And then you can actually do that for some of your other dashboards. Now, now I have a couple of different um, backgrounds here. And usually when I show this, I always select like Iron Maiden. But Lucas always reminds me that, hey, John, if you put like these little monsters on dashboards, that draws attention away from the data. That's one of your rules. So let's not do it. Since I have Andy on here, he's a big fan of Sound of Music. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, I want a Sound of Music background. And then there's advanced here, where if I wanted to add more tags, I can do that here as well, or even change the owner of the dashboard. So if I'm building this for Andy, I can actually click here other and just put Andy's email address in here. I'll leave that off and then just simply click done. Now what's happening is it's gone through and it's now built this Andy dashboard because I put the name in front and it's gonna put CPU utilization here as well. I can simply click here, the link within the BizOS configurator to launch this dashboard, or I can go into Dynatrace and I can put in a tag for CPU or platform and be able to find this dashboard quickly. I'll just simply launch here to show the dashboard. And then what I'll do here is I'll go up into a full screen mode. And if you see quickly, it showed really quickly that yeah, it put that little banner to say, hey, you know, this is a power up. It had noticed I had the power up installed. And then here's the dashboard. And I was able to change the background. Now, Andy, if you're looking, I can zoom in and see the lovely background of Sound of Music here with uh, Captain Von Grabner and his seven beautiful singing children as my background for my dashboard. So now you need to explain to my wife why there's a different woman next to me. This is going to be challenging. Well, we can just maybe kind of shuffle that and move that over here a little bit more. But again, the idea is like, hey, if you want to have like a nice, you know, background, uh, the only thing different is, is that we did it with, uh, you know, power-ups here. And so and if you ever wanted to here, I can simply clone this dashboard, right? Because I made it as the, the owner of the token shows up here as well. And then I could go ahead and edit this dashboard and then see how are we doing that background Right, and you notice here if I edit, and if I scroll down, there's a tile here that shows that we're using the power command for background, and I'm pulling the image out of my uh, GitHub repo, right? And it's just a SOM JPEG, right? So now you can actually use this, and if you have a, a, a document repository or anything out there that has images, you can use the same type of technique. Just push the markdown tile somewhere below the page fold. And we'll grab this and then change the background for you on the fly. Okay. So that's one quick way of being able to um, just see how you can create a dashboard. But let's get into something a little bit more uh, beefier. All right. So if I go ahead and here and click deploy, I'm going to change it to app owner. And I'm going to do user journey. And if you notice here on the user journeys, I have quite a few, one for mobile. I have one that you know basically has you know if I don't want to define key user actions that's here. Um, there's a lot of different options. The one that's really has the richest features is this user journey extended. All right. Uh, again, it's, it's using power ups, but if you don't want to use that, there's other um, you know, non power up versions of this dashboard as well. The prerequisites here, which I've already um, deployed within my environment, is tell me that I need to create a conversion goal. Right, for how are users converted here? When they hit the purchase step, that's like something called the order confirmation, right? So you create a conversion goal called order confirmation or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then we have a milestone goal because the reason why within user journeys, if users hit into the home page and they leave, I don't want that to influence my abandoned numbers. But after they log in, then I want them to say that if they have not purchased, then I want to call that abandoned. So I have control over this funnel as to what is a, a, an abandoned and what's not. And we do this by creating a second conversion goal. We just call it a milestone goal. And I could do this on like add the card, login, or any step here as well. And then each step here, so I have four steps, 
uh, mark as a key user action. So I've already done that within my tenant. So I'm good to go and I can deploy this dashboard. So what we'll do here is we'll name this, put Andy in front here again. And then the first prompt here is just gonna say, what, what application do you wanna build this on, right? So I'm gonna build this on my angularEasyTravel.com application. So you can see we use the API to pull all those application names in and that allowed me to select it. So you don't have to type in the name, fat finger it and cause a problem later. And then I'm gonna go ahead here and hit next. Now what happened is we went and used the API to pull out all the key user actions, right? And we have them here. If you hit more, it's gonna give more actions to be able to pull through. And I can build this funnel if I wanna add more steps, you support up to 10, or you can build this you know, by two or three steps. I'll leave this at four. What I'm gonna do here is just change the labels. So I'll call my first step home. My second step here would be login. My third step here would be maybe like a search. All right, and then I have add the cart, but I can leave that off. And the last one here is purchase. And that's just being able to have the label show up nicely within the dashboard. And then now the cool part here is I just drag and drop these user actions into each area. So my first step home is there. Login is here. Uh, this particular journey here is my search. And then my validate credit card shows up here as well. Now, if I have you know tons of key user actions, or a lot of actions that show up here, I can always go down here and search for them pretty quickly, right? So if I wanted to see you know my credit card, and it's a quick, easy way for me to find that and just drag and drop it if I need to. Uh, the funnel is built down here, the query itself. Uh, I don't need to make any changes to it, but if I needed to kind of change this in any way, shape, or form, I could hit the pencil icon kind of modify that. I'll keep it as is, hit next. Now, the first three uh, boxes here are, are optional, right? So if I wanted to build this user journey, which is going to look at how users come in and book travel by a certain geographical location, so I want to look at my European user journey, I can actually go down here and filter on a certain location. Uh, I can also filter all my tiles based upon a session property. So think like member status. So I can create a platinum user journey. And when if I supply this and pull up that particular where clause, let's say where my you know, member status is platinum, every tile will get filtered that way as well. Uh, conversion message is just that, hey, if I get to the last step, the order confirmation page, is that a conversion or do I need a successful message that comes back from the application saying that, you know, purchase your credit card was successfully built, right? So you can actually add that in and filter your journey uh, based upon that as well. I'll leave these off since they're optional, but my conversion goal is the credit validate or credit card validation here. And my a milestone would be login, right? So I'll just go ahead and select those two. The last here, I'm not gonna really change any of these. These are just all the thresholds that are defaulted. So this is really kind of telling the power up is that, hey, what is a really good number for conversions and what is warning and critical? I do this for abandons, for app decks. So these are just all different kind of thresholds that you can dictate as to how the dashboard's built. Uh, I'll leave them there as, as a whole and just go ahead and hit done. Now this creates a, a, a bunch of linked dashboards together, right? That the, the now allows me to go in and analyze the, the user journey, all right? Now what I can do here is I can click here to launch into uh, this user journey, but I wanna show you a different way of how I can get there. All right, if I start out, you know, we've all kind of went into Dynatrace before, hopefully. Uh, we know that the problem card Davis is automatically crunching all the numbers and it came up and told me that you know, maybe earlier this morning, I had a problem within my application, right? So if I step into this particular problem card, I have another extension. It was uh, developed by one of my colleagues, uh, Alistair Emsley, and it gives me more business context into the problem card, right? So right now I know that this particular problem affected four applications and 155 users, but I just built this Andy book travel user journey is this problem impacting users where they, they can't convert and so forth, right? So when we look here, we start to compare that, how much revenue is generated um, you know, same time yesterday, same time last week, right? So during the life of the problem, we, we generated 164,000 in revenue and we see that that's actually an increase, right? So it's not really impacting things, but there, there potentially could be a problem. If there is a problem with, users aren't able to log in because of this problem or aren't able to purchase travel because of this problem, then what we can do from here in the problem card is just go ahead and link in 
and pull up that user journey, okay? And this is a user journey, you know, that we created. Uh, we show everything that shows up here from home, login, review, purchase, right? All the different steps. And what I can do here now is pull up my recent time frame of when I had the problem. And I apply that to the dashboard. And what I can now start to see here is that my home and review step look fine, but the issue is here around login where we have a lot of abandons, 47 uh, from the login page uh, that don't continue forth. It's also shown here that my conversions are yellow. So this is really, you know, follow the red, follow the yellow. If there's a problem, this dashboard is really trying to show you here. Well, let me go ahead and go full screen. And I'm going to zoom in here as well. Now, within this view here, if I have a problem, right, I can now start to see that I have 47 users that are um, abandoning. I have my app decks for each individual step here that shows up below. All right, now, if I kind of interested, there's a help icon that shows all the great features here. I can simply click on this icon here. But the problem is resonating here around login. So by simply clicking on this icon, I'm going to link to another dashboard that's automatically created. When I dragged and drop all those user actions in that funnel, it built this particular dashboard out. And so what is going on here is the top row is showing me all the users that continued from login to review. The bottom row shows me all the sessions that exited at login. Now, if I scroll over here, I can see, is there a big difference in duration for those that continued? versus those that exited, right? It has a little bit higher duration. But if I keep scrolling over to the side here, we look at all the different performance KPIs, I now start to see, ha ha, the users that continued had very low number of errors, the users that exited had a lot of errors, okay? So 322. So now I know that with you know the problem card, my uh, guys that support the application, Davis detected the root cause and they're looking to fix it. But as a application owner, I can simply click here and just start to give more visibility into the problem. This is now exposing every user that hit the login step, they did not go to my uh, you know, review or search step, and they had errors. And I list every single one of those out here. So these are all my abandoned users. If I drill into any one of these users now, I can start to see, well, what was causing the underlying problem, right? And I can go down here, I can see all the steps, and they had a problem and also a rage click right at the validate credit card step. So if I select here, I'll move through quickly so we have enough time for Q&A. I can look at the performance waterfall and I can do this for any of the sessions that have abandoned in. And if I scroll down here, I can see the reason why is that they're getting an error message when they try to validate their credit card. Now, if I click here, I'm now into the exact details of that particular error. So the dashboards are really powerful from the point of view that you can you know, quickly interact as the kind of Lucas showed, isolate the problem. And I even put it in the context when I had this problem active and then drill down from there to get to like a root cause uh, what's going on with the dashboard as a whole. Now, if I go back out to my dashboards here and I just sort by creation that, all right, this is the Andy user journey that we created here um, easily. I can now go back to full screen. One last thing to show within this dashboard is that you can customize and change this pretty quickly here, all right? So that if I scroll down here, I have a lot of another graphs and say, Andy, you really like duration over time. So if you like this view here that shows my fast, medium, slow users and how they impact and are impacted by conversions and so forth, if I hit the pin icon, watch what happens. This takes that tile and moves it up here and, and replaces that those app decks individual for each step, right? So I have this view here. And then I can now start to do things where, hey, if I wanna go and say, how is this looking for the past two hours? Then my graph scales here and I can say, show this in uh, 10 minute intervals. And then now I have a nice two hour graph, you know, within, you know, 10 minute intervals here that shows uh, the, the duration that shows up below. If I wanted to get the app decks individual back in, then I could hit the pin icon here and I'll flip that back into the dashboard. You, and then once you like this, you can actually mark this as, hey, this is my favorite preferred view. So it's easy to find this dashboard pretty quickly, All right? And then lastly, if you wanna look here a little bit more, um, each of these icons, if this shows kind of red here, if I go the last say seven days, then my conversions might not be uh, performing well. 
and they actually show here green, but if I click it, it's taking me to a conversion analysis screen. I did a similar one for abandons, but now I can break down my overall conversions, how many of those were satisfied, tolerated, or frustrated. And so we had 963 conversions where users were frustrated. I can see the plots here over time. And then if I click this link, guess what? We expand and show you every single user that converted that was frustrated. And then you can do the same type of analysis of drilling here if you need to a little bit further. So I know we have roughly 10 minutes or so left. Uh, so I want to do a quick pause here. Andy, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we had. And uh, I think Lucas and I, we have already answered most of them. There was one question, Lucas, I know you answered it and I answered it too. This came from a user asking about Epmon to Dynatrace conversion. Uh, and I think at least my answer was, right, it doesn't, always makes sense to do a one-to-one -one conversion because Dynatrace is so much more powerful there's so much more data and so many more capabilities um, especially around the filtering the specific use case was how can I, how can I build a dashboard uh, that shows me let's say my JVM metrics of a particular set of machines that are part of an application and this is obviously great in Dynatrace now with your management zones with your tagging with your filtering and you can build your dashboards and and so this and was that's actually so Andy, that's that's a, that's a good question because I'm taking a lot of different things that were in Atmon to see. Yeah, you know, people are familiar maybe with some of the different dashboards there. And I'll give an example here really quickly. We had one where a customer liked a lot of the uh, the NAM or which used to be called DC run back in the mm -hmm. old days, and they liked a lot of the heat maps. And and uh, Lucas kind of showed the heat map where we can actually transform an existing chart into a heat map here. But what they didn't really kind of like about this is that you set the thresholds and applies it to all applications equally. And so we did here, so I go down to this heat map. All right, now this actually builds out uh, a heat map that looks very similar to what the users were working with the DC run the NAM product, right? That's mm -hmm. now being sunsetted. Uh, we support up to 28 applications and each application has its own thresholds, right? So then now we can build this out, show all the different applications you can build this for app decks, uh, duration, errors, however you want to build it. And you have control now over each app. You simply just go through here, hit next, deploy. You basically select up to 28 apps and you deploy mm -hmm. it. You're good to go. So, yeah. so we're looking to try and bring in a lot of the app mon that people are familiar with where it makes sense, as well mm -hmm. as the DC ROM in there. Mm -hmm. Very great. Thank you so much. And as said earlier and asked multiple times, uh, a lot of the features that you've shown today come through the Power Apps. A lot of them are already mm -hmm. making or will make it into the core product. Uh, Lucas, I think the current question that just came in will probably be something you want to follow up with um, on, I don't know, where the best place is, maybe on your GitHub project or just take it. Um, we have about two minutes left because I told you I have a slight hard stop today because of another event. John, this was phenomenal what you showed us. It's really cool. I especially like the sound of music, background image. <laughs> we'll see. I had to get that in there. So. Yeah. But, um, but again, just quickly, Andy, that yeah. Um, yeah, if you look here, if it says thresholds, I haven't converted these ones yet, but anything that says thresholds or the gem or power ups, mm -hmm. but you notice that there's a great number of dashboards here that yeah. don't record that. And it's more of those than, than, than of the power ups. So, so don't get kind of like, hey, I don't want to deploy the extension. I can't use this. Yeah. There's so many dashboards here that will fit and, perfect. And I think this is also because so many people are asking, so what is a good dashboard? I mean, now you have a list of a collective list of dashboards that people have built and are using on a day-to-day -day basis. I saw people like Sergio, who is who, mm -hmm. who, prom who gave also his dashboards. And I know he's pretty big on the Kubernetes monitoring and, and especially on the DevOps and app on, on application side. So this is... Um, it's really phenomenal. Yeah, yeah and here's, yeah. you know, Sergio did, you know, contribute some some good, good dashboards here as well mm -hmm. around Kubernetes. And right, so again, you wanna be a contributor, let us know, or just, hey, you wanna just give us here some JSON, we'd be more happy to work with you on that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely uh, utilize the configurator, just makes life a lot easier. Uh, it does deploy the dashboards and does it pretty quickly. But then you have the ability to go in and, and actually modify, add more tiles, take other tiles away. You can use that as a basis to get mm -hmm. to where you need to go. Right? Yeah. So it's not the end all, but I think it's really, really close. Yeah. John, can you do me a favor and can you go over to the last slide so the people, I know they have, they have your names, but just to make sure 
Exactly. Absolutely. Just put it in full screen. So if anybody's interested, first of all, this has been recorded. We'll put it up on YouTube and on university.dynatrace.com. We have posted the links. The slides will also be made available on university. So we, we already posted the links into the chat window in case you haven't seen it. Uh, but you will also find the slides probably by tomorrow on university.dynatrace.com. And then you can also get all the links. I am looking forward to having you back because I know this is a lot of <clears throat> stuff, a lot of innovation happening here. And um, I can just applaud because this was really awesome. And it seems the audience liked it awesome. as well because a lot of great feedback. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.